Good afternoon, uh, my name is Keith Hackett and this is my contribution, or mine and a number of other people's who I know and uh, hopefully get on with, um, to the Lyme Regis Fossil Festival. Um, it's Valerie Asbo, Reflections of a Socialist Fossil Collector. A curious title, um, I should explain a little, I should explain about the origins of it. Um, and why it's online, and why I'm slightly uncomfortable with that. And anyway, let's press on. Um, here we are. It's, uh, I'm in Lyme Regis. It's just gone three o'clock on the 17th of October. And finally, I have to commit myself to uh, putting this online. It isn't how I wanted it to be, and it isn't when I wanted it to be. Um, the origins of this conversation, and I do hope it is a conversation, um, go back to 2019, to a couple of articles in the Guardian, the Observer newspaper, um, that talked about the commercial collecting of fossils. It's something I feel quite strongly about, um, not because I think it's wrong, but because I think it's a completely reasonable thing to do. Um, I'd like to explain why. The article in question, or one of them, was featured on the 24th of February. 2019, and it led off, and I'm going to put a caveat in here that says, this is what the article says, the individual they quote says, and of course, we all know that the press doesn't necessarily um, report accurately, but the article says, um, as a headline, that Catherine Bad Badgley, the former president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists, uh, believes the following, the sale of all fossils is inappropriate, the commodification is in principle inappropriate because it motivates unscrupulous people. For someone who has sold fossils in the past, not very many, um, but have sold them in the past, that clearly makes me one of those unscrupulous people. I'd like to explain to you, or try and explain to you, why I don't think that's the case. But I'd like to do it in a sort of discursive and strange manner, um, because that's what I am, uh, in the hope that this can create a conversation that will somehow heal the rift between academics and uh, the commercial collecting community. So where should we start in these strange pre uh, post-COVID times? Let's begin where it began for me, here in Lyme Regis, at the age of six. My folks used to bring us to Lyme Regis. They had a family friend here, went back to the war, um, and we stayed with Mrs. Newbury, Mr. and Mrs. Newbury, up above the co-op in their B&B. At the age of six, I remember being taken along the beach towards Charmouth and finding a fossil. For me, it was an absolutely life-changing experience. I'm not alone in that. The more fossil collectors, paleontologists, professional or commercial or just amateur like myself uh, that I talk to, the more the same story comes through over and over again. There is something about being six, seven or eight as a child when you're open to new ideas and new things and you see something absolutely amazing for the first time and you pick it up and you look at it and you put it in your pocket that can be awe-inspiringly life-changing. And so it was for me, and so it was for people like Richard Edmonds, Lizzie Hingley, Chris Moore, and indeed a whole load of other collectors who, who I have come to know, um, get to know over the years. Um, over and over again, two towns, Lyme Regis and Charmouth, feature in that narrative. And it's always more or less the same. You went down on the beach and you picked up a fossil 
and somehow you related to this thing from deep time and it changed how you viewed the world. I live in London and uh, having found a fossil in Lyme Regis, well they are, we all accept, relatively common, I then went back to London and attempted to find a fossil there. It's much easier than perhaps people think, um, but what you find isn't quite what you find in Lyme Regis. So back home we went, um, me and my family, um, living in North London, and the mither and nag factor, which was me having found a fossil, is I want to find some more. The obvious place that you find fossils in London is to go to a museum. Unfortunately, the 74 bus ran from close by my house all the way to South Ken. So the 74 bus became the regular route to go and go and gaze in amazement at the specimens in the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum was for me a place of huge, awesome, eye-opening opportunity. It was also free. And being free is something that really, really mattered to me and my parents back then. Um, it was about ready access to me in another world. It wasn't just the NHM. As I got older, I discovered the building next door, the Institute of Geological Sciences. The NHM had the awesome specimens. The Institute of Geological Sciences had a gallery that was about, about British, British fossils, mainly English and Welsh fossils, in fairness, um, and time. And I would go there as a kid, get on the bus during the summer holiday, during the holidays, and go and painstakingly stare, learn, learn the exhibit. And by the age of 11, 10, 11, um, I was completely obsessed with the view that what I was going to do was find fossils for the rest of my life. I was aided and abetted in that mission by bumping into people an undergraduate who lived round the corner who was studying geology at King's named Julian Hollis, and the London Naturalist Society who ran field trips. We went to chalk pits across the South, the south Downs. Um, I, went, I went to Brighton, to, to, to Berlin Gap with my, with my aunt, um, and all the time I collected fossils. And then I went to Abbey Wood in Kent, and I surface collected at Abbey Wood from the, from, the shell, from the shell bed that is there with all the vertebrates in it. That led me and my mate Dave, to, to, my mate Dave, on his only time that he went there with us, found a piece of mammal jaw. Um, me, on the other hand, I found a boring mollusk. Um, it's a unique boring, boring mollusk. Um, but a boring mollusk all the same, and it led me to an outfit called the Tertiary Research Group and I became the, what, the youngest of the founding members of the TRG. The TRG led me to bulk sampling and the ability when you live in a really small flat um, to have thousands of specimens that fit into a very, very, very small space. I interpret all the time, all the way through my youth, there was this constant calling to come back to Lyme. I went um, to college to, to study geology in Manchester. And was much further from the sedimentary rocks of the, of the, of the tertiary and the Jurassic that uh, applied my trade in, if you like, or, or learned learn the beginnings of, of paleontology. And over time, I kind of gently, not fell out of love with the topic, but had to do other things. Um, and do other things I did until, until 2002. In 1995, my daughter was born. Um, 2002, she was seven. And me and a lot of other friends, um, who, a lot of friends who were also parents, well, parents, other kids, I, people knew that I had this thing about fossils. And their kids began to get this thing about fossils and they said, where can we collect fossils? And I said, oh, well, we'll all go to Lyme Regis. We'll book, book a place and we'll all go down there and we'll collect fossils. And from 2002, actually earlier than that, but from 2002, um, we regularly 
brought parcels of kids from my hometown now, Liverpool, down to Lyme Regis, where we collected fossils. And they, in turn, went through the same inspirational journey, or a version of the same inspirational journey that I went through. But critically, in amongst all this, and this takes us back to the sale of all, foss all fossils inappropriate, um, it seemed to me, well, it doesn't take us right back to there, but it takes us back to a place where the key thing in amongst all this was the ability to collect them. Because you didn't just look at them in the rock, you picked them up, you took them home, you had them about the place, and you wondered in awe of the things they were. And so from 2002 until 2000, until now, Every, every month, Mary Coates, my partner, and I return to Lyme Regions for six months out of the year, but one week out of each month, and we come to collect. Why is that important? For me, it just gives some sort of sense of worth and release and stuff like that. But along the way, a number of things have happened. When I was very young, back in my teens, I collected the tertiary research group. And when geologists, paleontologists meet, there's a sort of a sort of discussion that goes on when it is the how serious you are. And we ask each other questions like, have you have you got any fossils named after you? And what is it you found? And the critical exciting one, how many holotypes have you got? Well, in my case, I'm very proud to say I have three. I haven't described them. They're all described by a guy called Fred Stinton. And they're all vertebrates from the Apresian, from the London clay. I am immensely proud to have found them. I am immensely proud that Fred has described them. And I'm immensely proud they're in the National Collection, in the Natural History Museum. They are at Euroconga. Centroberyx and Peristidium, three species or three genus of Telios fish. If I showed you what the specimens would look like, I mean, fish, vertebrates, and suddenly ears prick up with excitement about uh, their fish. They're not run of the mill mollusks or anything like that. They are vertebrates. They're the top end of the collecting topography. Um, what they actually are. Rotoliths. They are the, the ears, the balance mechanisms of Telios fish. And if you see them, and I will post on the website the pictures of them, then you'll be gravely disappointed. Their value is wholly scientific. They are the only known spe specimens of each species. They are the holotypes, and they all come from Shinfield uh, in Berkshire from a temporary exposure in the London clay on the M4. There is another specimen that we have collected that is also unique and it isn't as bow the fish. The fourth specimen is a bryzoa. A bryzoa from Pinhay Bay here in here adjacent to Lyme Regis. And that too rests in the Naturalist Museum it was given to the museum, it was given about 11 years ago, and I will make the time to find out whether it's ever got described or indeed cleaned. But it's been presented, and it was presented by Mary, my partner, she found it, and I'm delighted that it's there. So why is all this important? Where does this all take us in terms of valuing ASPO? I I spent a lot of time in my life um, working with social, enter social enterprises, commercial enterprises, job creating employment, um, working with the European Union on regional policy, um, advocating different ways of working and so forth. And as part of all that, I have had to develop views about where value lies in, in both financially and in terms of society. 
I want to take you through that sort of matrix about value. And I want to compare it to the values that I think um, were in the articles in, that were run by the Observer about commercial fossil collectors. And I hope by the end of it to have demonstrated that there's a great deal more to be valued than simply one or two things around market price or science. So here we go. You'll forgive me. The original, uh, the original presentation was meant to be interactive. It was meant to be collective. It was meant to have people giving views from the audience. None of that is possible. So you're going to get a talking head and some post, some post-it notes. It is what it is. And if it's really boring, you know what? You can always turn me off. Here we go. Let's deal with these. First of all, let's talk financial value. As part of the research for this contribution, I talked to a number of people about market value, sale, sales value. And so let's deal with that one and let's deal with it very, very quickly because there is no question that you can sell fossils. Fossils have been sold for as long as they have been collected. Mary Annie sold fossils. I speak to you from 40 yards from Mary's gravestone here, adjacent to the grave, well, in this flat adjacent to the graveyard on the top of the cliff by St. Michael's Church. Mary Anning sold fossils because she had to. There was no other way of earning them. It was her way of earning a living. The question then about sales value is how much should you sell a fossil for? I'm just going to let that one hang because arguably, a sale is a willing seller and a willing buyer. It is really that simple. And with those two things in place, a sale can happen. But there is a financial value. And one of the criticisms of the, of, of the um, Society, Society for Vertebrate Paleontology is that the excessive sales values associated with trophy specimens of vertebrates, notably dinosaurs, um, has the effect of somehow undermining the scientific community. They may or may not be right, um, but it does. But, but to put a blanket embargo, therefore, on the com uh, rejecting the uh, as, as it as has been said, that it is simply about the commodification which is in principle inappropriate because it motivates unscrupulous people, seems like one hell of a blanket approach to something that really is a great deal more sophisticated. Let's talk then a little about what happens when you sell things. Let's talk about surplus value. It's a socialist concept. It predates Marxism. Um, Marx it didn't appropriate it. He included it. Uh, but it, it was a socialist concept, it is a socialist concept, and it is about the difference between what it takes for someone to create something when it is first sold and the value, that the, the, the labour element within it, the cost that's associated with, with the origination of the thing and the subsequent profits that, that are made as it rolls on and on and on. Um, Mary Anning's first well-known find was in 1811 when she was 12. That sounds like she was a kid. Just remember that kids were being stuffed up chimneys at the age of seven and, it, and la were largely uneducated back then. At the age of 12, Mary Annie was working. It was her job and her job was to find fossils and they were, the fossils were there to be sold in order to keep body and soul for their family together. In 1811, Joseph Anning dug up a four-foot ichthyosaur skull, and a few months later, Mary found the remainder of the body. It was sold. It was sold for £23. It was sold on. It was sold on again. And finally, in 1819, it was purchased by the British Museum for £45 and five shillings. The surplus value in amongst that was £22.50. 
15 shillings. I think I've got that right. It was nearly 33, 23 pounds. It had effectively doubled its value, doubled, doubled its sales value between the time it was found, and not just found, because the Annings didn't just find these fossils, they found the people to buy them, but they also prepared them along the way. A painstakingly intricate process, and something I'm going to come back to shortly. But they found them, they sold them on, and the surplus value was more or less the same as the original value that the earnings were, were, were paid for, for the specimen. That is entirely normal under a capitalist system. I'd like to think that other models like the radiologies are available. Let's talk about another, another kind of financial value. Let's talk about labour value. Mary and I have collected regularly on this coast for 17 years. It's actually 18 years now, but I did the calculations back in 2019 because that's when we were originally going to do this presentation um, and everything slipped. Um, we collect for six months in only 12 months and we collect for one month a week. Uh, so one, one week per month over those six. We spend three hours on average per day actually collecting on the beach. That's the time when the tides are low. And in our case, we spend all that time collecting almost exclusively on the ledges. That's the bits that come out at low tide and go back under the sea. In effectively, we spend 18 hours collecting, actually collecting in any one month. And so in six months, we have 108 collecting hours. In effect, we, each, each year, spend the equivalent of 14 eight-hour days on the beach collecting fossils. And we find precious little, in truth, for all that effort. Um, Mary collects less than I do. So, so, 14 days is mine. Mary collects less than I do. So Mary collects for about seven. So let's say that in total, both of us combined collect for 21 days. 17 years times 21 days is a total of 357 days of collecting. And that is the number of days that we have spent on the beach collecting fossils on the ledges in Lyme Regis since 2000, between 2002 and 2019. If you add... 10 hours of travelling time, because we live in Liverpool, for both of us, and you add it all up, so you add all of that, so there is some travelling time, and all we do, right, I'd ask you to remember this, is we only collect. We don't prep, we don't research, we don't sell on, we don't network, we don't do any of the other stuff that an awful lot of other collectors do, we don't publish, we simply collect. We collect, we come back, we wash them off and we stick them in a bowl. And very often, we give them away. We give them away to school kids, we give them away on the beach, or we give them to local schools in Liverpool. We give them away. I'll come back to why we do that later. But between 2002, when you roll it all together, um, Mary and I, between us, have spent 1.683 years of our lives collecting fossils in Lyme Regis. And we do it relatively infrequently compared to the other collectors who are resident down here. What's the monetary value, the labour value of one point, and I need to get this right, one point six eight, three years. If it's the adult minimum wage per hour in 2019, then the value of our labour is somewhere around £28,000. If it's the adult living wage, it will be £32,000. 
If it was the median weekly earnings of full-time employees in, two, in April 2019, it would be £51,000. And if we we're on the average salary of a US professor, like the US professor who was quoted in the article in The Observer, then it would be £132,705. That is a lot of effort and a lot of value, but somehow, if you're a collector, it's being seen as inappropriate. And I find that very sad. So, what about other values? Or what about, where does that take us? Why is it? when it comes to fossil collecting, an adequate recompense for one's labour, for one's time, isn't considered acceptable. Why is it that it is acceptable to have an art market where the mere ownership of something, which increases in value, this whole surplus labour value thing, this financial value thing, where things are considered to be investments, even though the, the, the labour element involved in them is long dead and gone, why is it that that is a per perfectly acceptable market, whereas one that involves people going out week after week after week in the worst of weathers into obscure places with huge amounts of local knowledge why is that something that to be frowned on and in certain cases to be criminalised? I don't understand it. Um, but we'll come back. We'll come back to that. Let's talk about other values first. Let's talk about societal values. I think these are much more interesting. Those otoliths which I am so proud, that Bryzoa, they have scientific value. They have clear scientific value. They are the only examples of their species in existence in public collections anywhere. That doesn't mean they're the only examples in existence. A lot of them are still under the ground, I am sure. But in terms of scientific value, they are lodged in museums and that is a function of a museum. And that is great and that is to be applauded. They are described, so be it. Um, well, they're not described, but in the case of, of, of the three otoliths, they are described and I am proud to have donated them. But what other values, alongside scientific, does they exist in society, in society, in societal terms? Um, I'd like to choose education as the next one. The museum in Lyon Regis, I talked with Dave Tucker, who's the director, as part of the research for this. And one of the most inspirational things, that, one of the most inspirational parts of our conversation was where he talked about the museum as a centre for fieldwork. The museum looking out beyond its collections, the role that museums have to play with young children and school parties, the people, Paddy, Chris, Richard, who run the walks along the coast and who I see daily inspiring young minds. The educational value associated with fossils is absolutely immense, as it is with all sorts of other activities. And so in societal terms, fossils have a massive educational role to play Along to, alongside the scientific. The fact that fossils tend to be find, find their way into museums somehow conflates these two. But they shouldn't do because the educational value here in Lyme Regis includes the ability to go into commercial fossil shops and stand in awe, to stand on the beaches, to walk around the town 
and to generally absorb a whole series of that of of of, edu of educational experiences, which, as the town itself builds on its history, its legacy, its lo its localism, so it adds adds educational value over and over and over again. Link to educational value is something that I call inspirational value. Whether one likes it or not, part of what inspires a kid when they see a fossil is size. There is no question about it. It inspired me when I went to the Natural History Museum in London and walked through the, reptile gallery, the marine reptile galleries, and it inspires kids now. And so if that is around museums, and it probably is, but it's also around fossil shops and it's around beaches, then the inspirational bit is really important. And the inspirational bit is about having the most magnificent, of, of, the, of the specimens available to see publicly. And you know what? Lyme Regis has failed completely in that one. Bits and pieces are available, don't get me wrong. But there is so much more it could do. Add to that local value. My home's in Liverpool. I've been a politician in Liverpool for a long time. I was a politician in Liverpool. I have worked on local economic development projects um, in Liverpool um, for a very long time. And there is something that is really important if you want to be about placemaking and local value. Local, Lyme Regis, Charmouth, this area, the wider Jurassic Coast, has been involved in, lo in local placemaking for a considerable length of time, and it's been very good at it. But missing is the link between the inspirational value and the local value, and indeed the scientific value, associated with some of the most amazing large um, specimens that have come from this coast. They are, and let's be absolutely clear about it, held by people who have invested their labour for tens of years collecting on this coast. People like Chris Moore, people like Dave Sol. They hold unique collections that have to have a future somewhere. And in the case that I can I'll speak for Chris because I know him well, in the case of Chris, um, he could have sold that to a Middle Eastern museum. It would have been the bedrock of a museum many times over, I am sure. The fact that he's chosen not to and seeks instead to set up the major exhibit for Jurassic fossils, particularly vertebrates, is to his immense credit. Yes, he sells fossils the same way as Mary Anning did, because that's how he's living. But he, along with other people, have this group of fossils which he calls finders. Lizzie Hingley does it too. It's a fi it's sorry, not finders, keepers. Lizzie does it, Chris does it, it's a keeper. They're the ones you want to keep because somehow you think they're the very, very best and they matter more than, 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 than the others. Let's add a couple of other values to the keepers, uh, to, to that. Let's talk about marriage value. One of the things that these large collections um, offer is the fact, Steve Etches is another, that it is a collection and not simply one or two individual items. It's about time I mentioned Asbo. Asbo's a fish. Asbo, we were told, is one of the best preserved fish, lower lias fish, lias fish, um, found anywhere in the UK or indeed Europe. Um, it's a hell of a responsibility to have. Um, and we found it back in 2008. Um, I'll talk about it more in a bit. But for us, Asbo on its own doesn't really cut it. 
as though, as part of the wider exhibit, has much more marriage value because it's set in a context. And in our case, we have taken the decision that ASBO, to date, has never moved more than three miles from the place where we found it. It has been exhibited twice, but at the moment it remains in, in private hands and it needs a future. But it has marriage value, the same way as Chrissy's wider collection has marriage value. And if you sell it off as pieces, um, then the pieces are less are worth far less than the whole. Let me offer you two other values. One is cultural. Well, I'm going to put them over there because somehow, and I object to this a lot, um, cultural value is well, a cultural. Let me give you an example of cultural value. In August this year, a letter from, Simon, from Mary Anning um, went up for auction. A local, a local fundraising campaign raised £40,000. The estimate for its sale was around £10,000. And in fact, it sold for £100,800. Um, it was a letter. And it has, and its worth was in its cultural value. Who, who had written it? To whom about what? I have to say, I find it strange that the Society for Vertebrate Paleontologists didn't write, didn't write about that as well, decrying its sale, urging the individual who sold it to instead donate it to a local museum. Um, as they did do previously with, with, with other vertebrate, spe with, with vertebrate, spe vertebrate fossil specimens, I find that very strange indeed, but they didn't. Nor do I find, no, no, it's equally strange, is there seemed to be no question at the time that, that it wasn't normal to have a fundraising campaign um, in order to raise the money for a piece of paper. The same is true of artworks, um, old masters and stuff like that. It goes back to this stuff up, stuff up here about labour and surplus um, and sales. It somehow is acceptable for there to be an art market, but not one in fossil specimens. And so there is this cultural value that exists around specimens, but at the moment, it's not the kind of cultural value that is given to artworks. And one of my questions that I would raise, and I have done constantly, is why ever not? In truth, unless it's contemporary art, then there is far more in the old masters. All of this stuff, that stuff, the labour value, has long gone. Uh, it's, it's, it's not... It's not there, they are dead objects. Whereas fossils, particularly contemporary, contemporary fossils, are very much about a value now. Finally, I want to talk about that. This is reinvestment value. Colonel Birch in 1820 became disturbed by the poverty that the Anning family lived in. And he took a decision that he would auction his collection of fossils that he had purchased from the Annings and return, it's done, the research doesn't say how much, but return the monies that were raised by that auction to the Anning family. And that is what he did. It changed the course of the Anning family's life and clearly it involved the sale of fossils. There comes a point, and Mary and I are at it with ASBO, um, where we have to consider ASBO's future. If ASBO is worth money, and there's absolutely no doubt that it is, then one of the questions 
one of the moral questions one has to ask is, is it fair simply to bottle up that value in a specimen or are there other things that that money can be used to do? In our case, we have to conclude that there is other things that either there is other things that money can do or the things that ASBO can do need to be maximised in terms of those. We've taken the view that ASBO needs to remain in Lyme Regis, that ASBO needs to be part of something that demonstrates local educational, scientific and inspirational value and that its marriage value is to be part of a wider, a, a wider display or collection. And we want to see that happen. We find it bizarre that this exceptional, this, this, this collection of exceptional specimens is something that has been talked about for nearly 20 years but doesn't seem to ever progress. And we similarly find it bizarre that other institutions along the coast, other, other scientific um, institutions along the coast, seem threatened um, to some extent by, 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 it, by it happening. We've suggested. Um, gently, that one of the options is to cross-subsidise the two things, um, to, to, to use cross-subsidy and to make the local value even greater. But let's go back to the real question in hand, or where, where we started. My problem with the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology and their statement that the sale of all fossils is inappropriate, the commodification is in principle inappropriate because it motivates unscrupulous people, is that I simply do not believe that to be the case. I hope I've gone some way to convincing people why not, because it is to do with all these different values. The problem I have with the SVPs is what they went on to say, or what their representative went on to say in the course of the rest of the article. I will read it, or I will try to read it. Um, I won't try to read it. I'll say this. Um, Catherine Badgley finished the article no, I won't say this. I'll say this. The preoccupations of the representative from the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists were wholly focused on the scientific value of the specimens to the individual academics who are associated with them. They truly, they objected to the financial value to sales value, they ignored labour value, um, they sought to get rid of surplus value simply by outlawing the sale, um, and they majored on the scientific value whilst mentioning virtually nothing about educational or local or inspirational or marriage or any of the rest of it. What they did do right at the end is they did a slight nod. They said, where the article went in the end, was a statement that people should steer clear of trophy specimens because people are often just as happy with something that is very common. Hidden in amongst all that, not that hidden, is an analysis around class. Not class in the... In, in the, in, in the Class, not class in the traditional Marxist sense, uh, but class as in expert and non-expert. My experience as a kid and the experience that I had on the beach earlier today where I watched a young girl walking up the slipway in front of me with a, with a sweatshirt with dinosaurs embroidered onto it 
um, having spent a time looking for fossils, is that there is a continuum between where you start and where you finish. Not all of us finish as academics, I'm delighted I never did. But along the way, all of this happens, not just that, the scientific one. I hope very much that somehow we can value ASBO in something that's much more holistic. Um, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you for listening.